I uh, got some fill in the blanks for you so you can follow along. These are new. All new. Yep, this is all new. I'm going to try to make it to where we just keep all new each week uh, and try to get through as much as possible uh, what we have in front of us. So uh, op- as you open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that outline is there to sort of help you um, keep in mind what we're looking at. Uh, what I have learned is that if I'm up here uh, talking for 45 minutes at a, at a time, um, and you're not involved, it's really easy to forget a lot of what's said. So I'm going to try to keep you involved as much as possible. Um, and we're talking about being children of the day this morning, and we're talking about the, the practical and doctrinal implications of that phrase uh, that's found in First Thessalonians chapter number 5. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, what I, what I want to look at here, we're going to start reading here in verse number... Uh, 1, and we'll read down to about verse number 10. All right, uh, verse number 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And we spent a lot of time talking about what that has to do with and how that is a reference to the second advent, not the rapture of the church. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We talked about the they and the thems last week and how that's a reference to the world, the people that are here during the tribulation. And in verse number 3 specifically, uh, you get a reference to Israel, as travail upon a woman with child. The cross reference there is Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. But look what he says in verse 4. All right, we, we laid a, a long foundation talking about that, that phrase, the day of the Lord and the thief in the night, and how that has to do with Again, the second advent of Jesus Christ where he comes to establish his kingdom on the earth, not so much the rapture of the church. And when you confuse the two, I'll tell you this right now, 1 Thessalonians 5 makes a lot less sense if you confuse the two. All right, because what he's doing is he's drawing a contrast. All right, he's drawing a contrast between those that are prepared, that understand they've been told about the day of the Lord and the thief in the night. that are not here for it and they've already been taken out. All right, versus those that are children of the night. He draws a contrast and calls us children of the day for that reason. All right. Uh, Keep reading. Look at uh, verse number four. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. We'll talk about what that means. Ye are all the children of of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the night. I'm going to show you from verse number 7 how, once again, you're going to see that is a second Advent reference that is not a thing about the rapture. Uh, that said, if you're a child of God, you shouldn't be drinking. Amen. 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 You should stay away from that stuff. It'll mess you up. All right? Uh, now, there's, there's a, a lot in the Bible about that. Uh, I know today's modern Christianity has a problem with the preacher saying you can't do something. It doesn't matter what it is. If you, how dare you? I've got liberty. I've got my rights. Okay, enjoy it and see how much fellowship you have with Jesus Christ. I, I've, heard, I've heard Christians tell me, I just don't get along with people at church. Well, who do you get along with? Well, I get along just fine with people at work. Well, that tells you more about you than it does people at church. You say, what's the problem? Well, you spend too much time with something. It doesn't matter what it is. If you get your mind polluted with the things of this world, or even the way modern Christianity looks at this stuff... You come to church and you go, man, I just don't get it. I don't like those people. That, that's right. You're not going to. You say, why? Because it doesn't work like that. You can't have both together. And so he's, he's drawing here practically. There's some real good stuff here about how to live the Christian life. He's talking about the condition of the Thessalonians and how they are children of the day. And as such, there's certain behavior that should follow that. All right. Uh, listen, it isn't the other way around. It isn't that I'm a child of the day because of what I'm doing. It's that because I'm a child of the day, I'm going to do certain things. That's how it ought to be lived out. All right? This is not a matter so much of salvation. It, it, yes, that's part of it. But furthermore, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, right, we have fellowship one with another. There's something in the Bible about light and fellowship with God and his people. And so there's, there's a call. There's a call here, guys, for us to be children of the day. And doctrinally speaking, your position in Christ is exactly that. And we're going to talk about how that fits into things prophetically, but practically I want you to understand the Lord has given us some really good instruction here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In light of the fact that you are not a children of darkness, in light of the fact that God has translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son, in light of all of that, live a certain way. 
Now, modern Christianity would say, well, it doesn't you know, matter what you do, it doesn't matter what you say. It does matter when you're a child of God. Now, let me go this way. I would spend about this much time talking to a lost person about drinking. You say, what? That's not the issue. <laughs> but man, once you're saved, once you're saved and you start polluting your mind and your, your emotions and your body with stuff that God did not intend, you say, what happens? You're not sober. You're not sober. And there is a call for the children of God, regardless of dispensation, to be children of, so of sobriety, to understand the times, to understand what's going on around them. Um, poor Ariana, you know, she, uh, was it last night? Last night, Isabella was saying goodnight to her. And, uh, you know, poor Ariana's on this, these pain meds, you know, and, and, and she's uh, at times not exactly herself. And she, she goes from, you know, basically saying, I don't want to take any pain meds. And then about five hours later, going, Dad, it's so bad, it's so bad. To then going, my stomach hurts, I hate these things. And it's a cycle, you know. I don't know how people live that way. She's just doing it for a week. But last night, Isabella goes to her, and she's saying goodnight to her, and, and Ariana grabs her hand, and she goes, God bless you. <laughs> she wasn't all there, man. You say, what is it? She's not exactly sober, all right? She's not aware of what's going on around her. And as a child of God, that, that, that is an illustration of how you should not be living your life. There should be an air of sobriety about you. It doesn't mean you can't laugh. It doesn't mean you can't smile. Good night. Some of God's people need to smile a little more. Some of you need to learn to tell a joke and laugh, a clean one, and just laugh every once in a while. It's not bad for you. You know, I can't, I, the other extreme is some kids in the church, how you doing? I'm just fine. I'm just a low down, no, good for nothing. Uh, a rotten sinner that God saved from. Okay, oh, we get it. We understand that. Smile a little bit, you know. Uh, but that said, there, there should, the world is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Everything's a party. Everything's a good time. No one's thinking about picking up after the mess of the party. Amen. And no one's thinking about the bills that follow. No one's thinking about the consequences later. They're just saying, you only live once. Enjoy it. And the Bible's the other way around. It says, hey, you got to be sober. In light, of what you, in, light of, in light of what's happening here, in light of where the world is headed, it should cause a little bit of sobriety in us. There in verse number 8, he says, But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. We'll talk about that. And for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also you do. I want to go back uh, to verse number four, and we're going to trace through these verses we just read. But again, with the thought that this is, uh, Paul is, is speaking to them about a period of time that they are not going to have to live through because they're going to be taken up before that. And Paul is giving them this, uh, this understanding that they are of the day and not of the night for a reason. Look at verse four, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. There's three reasons he says that. If you're going to write this in your outline, it says this, the fact that they know perfectly. Look back at verse, uh, verse number, let's see here, two. For yourselves, know perfectly. The fact that they know perfectly, or in other words, they were given knowledge and were not in the dark. They were given knowledge and were not in the dark. You know, when you say you're in the light, you're in the dark on something, that means you're not aware of it. You're, you're not conscious of it. You don't have the knowledge about that thing. If someone comes to me and says, um, hey, did you see who won the, the NASCAR 500? I don't know. I might be saying that wrong. Indy 500, whatever it is. You know what I'm going to say? I have no clue. You say, well, I'm in the dark on that sport. I know nothing about it. It doesn't interest me. And if I said something to you about football, you might say the same thing. The point is, if you're in the dark on something, you don't know about that thing. You, you don't have the knowledge about it. So when he says there in verse number four, you're not in darkness, you know what that means? Someone's turned the light on for him. And what, what he's referencing is the fact that Paul has already talked to them about this, and now he's writing a letter to reinforce what he has already taught them. Understand, keep this in mind, that when the disciples have Jesus Christ going back to heaven in the ascension in Acts chapter 1, all that they know is that there's going to be a second advent where he comes back to establish his kingdom. That's the last thing they know. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. You can read it for yourself later. And so what Paul is saying is that since that time, there's been some things that have been revealed to Paul, and Paul has taken those things that God revealed to him, and he's taught the churches where he's gone to minister. And so he's writing them saying, hey, you know perfectly, because why? I taught you this. So they're not in darkness on it. 
Let me give you the second reason. It's also a reference to the fact that the light of the world is inside of you. The light of the world is inside of you. Uh, you know the references in John. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Right? Uh, so again, the light of the world is inside. We talked about last week. Uh, look at it one more time. Keep your hand here in Thessalonians. Go over to uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Look, if you would, at verse number 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy... Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. You say, what is that light? That's Christ inside of you. A light that shineth in a dark place. What's that dark place? The world. Until the day dawn, second advent, the day star arise in your hearts. For you, that's the rapture. And the day star arise in your hearts. You say, what is that? That is uh, something that God put inside of you. And that light is inside of you. And if that light wasn't shrouded by your body, the world couldn't stand to see it. You say, what well, God puts the light of the world inside of a, uh, really, a vessel that's not fit for it. Uh, but God's in the, you know what he should be doing in your life? He should be cleaning you up as days go by. Clean you up so Jesus feels a little bit more at home in your body. Amen. And ultimately, someday, he's going to replace this house because it is broken down. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? This house is broken down. All right. Uh, remember the old Bob Vila? Was it Bob Vila, this old house? Is that Bob Vila? Well, whatever it was, whoever that was, all right. Uh, this old house is someday going to be replaced with a much better one. But in the meantime, the day, the day star is inside of you, and someday it's going to arise in your hearts. What does that mean? Rapture. That's the rapture. All right. So again, the lie of the world is inside of you. Go back to Thessalonians. Uh, and, and let me give you a third reason that he says that you're not in darkness. The third reason that you're not in darkness has to do with your doctrinal position in Christ. The world is in darkness right now. The world is in darkness right now. The lie of the world was rejected as found in John chapter 1, verse 11. He came into his own, his own received him not. All right, so the world is in darkness right now. And uh, however, you're not supposed to be in darkness. And positionally speaking, in Christ, you're not. But depending on how you live out, what God has shown you from the Word of God, what you hear from the preaching of the Word of God, what you get from your reading of your Bible, what you get in your prayer life, what you get when you're driving on the road listening to some preaching, whatever the case might be, when you get truth, depending on how you live that out, what you do with it, how obedient you are with that, it's going to determine how much of darkness is in you and how much of light has filled you. I'll put it to you this way. You're saved, right? The Spirit of God is inside of you. All right, well, why does he tell you to be filled with the Spirit? The reason he says that because there are times where you can be less filled with the Spirit and more filled with yourself or more filled with the world. And so the Lord is saying this, in light of where you're headed, walk in the light. That's the practical side of this. The doctrinal side of this is simply this. We are, while we are living in darkness, when Jesus Christ, the light of the world, was here, the world had light. But when he left, the world went back to darkness. And the darkest time that this world's ever going to experience is a time of great tribulation, which is yet to come. All right? And in light of that, what he's saying is, in light of the fact that you are no longer to be considered darkness because you are a child of light, all right, live that way. And in, in, in light of the fact of, uh, of prophecy and the timeline of God's order, if you will, what we are living through right now is darkness. Darkness. But eventually the day star is going to rise. All right? And uh, what you have throughout prophecy in the Old Testament, and we won't rehash all of this, Malachi chapter 4 is a great passage. It talks about the Son of Righteousness rising with healing in His wings. All right? And, and you say, think, think about this, the darkest and coldest time. You say, when is it? Look at uh, weather, weather.com, Weather Channel app on your phone or whatever. The, dark, the coldest time, you know when it is? It's right before sunrise. I know because I'm up, man. I'm out there, <laughs> and it's cold. <laughs> and I'm going, man, they says it's going to be 68 degrees today. It doesn't feel like it's 68 degrees. It doesn't feel close to it. And, and, and you say, what is that? It's a great picture of something. It's a great picture of the fact that before Jesus Christ comes back, it's going to get real bad. The world's going to get as far as it can from the Lord. And in light of that, guys, you need, to live, you need to be sober and understand where we're at in God's timeline. And you need to live that much more the life of a child of God, a child of light, if you will. Now, I don't believe in building doctrine based on typology. I do think typology can support good doctrine. You guys with me? 
I don't believe that you teach doctrine from types, but I believe types can reinforce or support what we're learning doctrine, what we've already looked at in light of the day of the Lord and the thief in the night thing and how it's not going to overtake us because why? We've already been taken out of here. We come back with him as a thief, right? Uh, look back at Mark chapter 6. I want to show you something. Uh, innocent little story here. You may never guess that it's a picture or something, but there's all kinds of things like that in your Bible if you're looking for them. Uh, and I want to point out something in Mark chapter 6 for you that reinforces what we're talking about. Mark chapter 6, look if you would at verse number 46. Mark 6, 46. When he had sent them away, his disciples, he departed into a mountain to pray. Verse 46 is a picture of the ascension of Jesus Christ. You say, why? He goes up. Where does he go? Into a mountain. He's heading up. And he sends the disciples to go somewhere. They've got a mission. They've been told to go somewhere. What is that a picture of? That's a picture of the ascension in Acts chapter number 1. All right? Verse number 47. Uh, and when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. Verse 47. The evening starting is a picture of the darkness of the church age, which eventually leads to the tribulation. All right? Verse 47 shows him being alone, which is a picture of him being in heaven. He is alone while his disciples are being sent somewhere. All right? Verse 48, if night... Look, look at verse 48. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night... Underline that. That's important. That's significant. All right? There are four watches in the night. And that fourth watch is the last watch in the night right before the sun rises. You say, what's that a picture of? It's a picture of Jesus Christ coming back to establish his kingdom on the earth. It's that fourth watch of the night. What is that fourth watch? It's a picture of the Great Tribulation. All right? It says there, in the fourth watch of the night, He cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. All right? It, verse 48, letter D, under 14, verse 48, If night is a picture of the church in the world, then the fourth watch is a picture of the Tribulation. This is the end that is described for us in Matthew chapter number 24. All right? Think about this. In verse 48... Point E, it mentions he would have passed by them. And that reference is more of a reference to saints in the tribulation than the rapture of the church. Guys, let me say it like this. If you're saved today and Jesus Christ uh, comes back today and calls us home, uh, you, you may go kicking a screen, but you're going. You may be living a filthy, wicked lifestyle and you may be living against God. I'm not advocating that you do so. And I'm not advocating that you test eternal security by being a fool. Amen. That, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. Regardless of what you do in the flesh, your soul is saved. And you've been marked. And you've been given the earnest of the redemption. That earnest is that down payment of your inheritance, the Holy Spirit of God. So that when Christ comes, whether you're looking for him or not, let me time out here for a moment. And let me say this, if you're saved, there should be nothing in your life more important, more glorious, more uh, that you look forward to more than anything else than Jesus Christ coming and taking you home. That's it. That's the most important thing. You get around a bunch of modern day Christians, you talk about that, and it's almost like a bunch of owls looking at you. You say, why? Because all the preaching that they hear about is how to, how to fix your finances, how to fix your marriage, how to do this, how to make an impact at work. Listen, I'm all for that. Nothing wrong with that stuff. But if you're living in light of nothing but the temporary, Jesus Christ coming back means nothing to you, even if you are saved. A lot of Christians live that way. But in, in light of what we're looking at, I want you to understand that when the Lord calls you home, you may go kicking and screaming, but you're going regardless. However, in the tribulation, if you're not looking for Him, and you're not living right, you know what He might do? He might just pass by you. There's that whole, that's the parable of Matthew 25 with the virgins and five were foolish and five were wise. Five were ready and five weren't. The average independent Baptist teaches that as people that thought they were saved in the church and weren't saved. Listen, that's nice and that's cute, but that doesn't jive with what happens in Matthew 25. And let me go a step further and let me say this. Anytime you see that Paul talks about people that uh, are called servants of Christ, they're saved people. When he refers to the chaste virgin, the bride, it's a singular uh, virgin. It's one. It's one body versus the ten virgins that are spoken of in Matthew 25. There's all kinds of reasons that it's not the church. But the point is this here in the, in the outline. I want to understand he would have passed by them as more of a reference to the saints in the tribulation than it is the rapture of the church. <clears throat> Lastly, let me say this. The fourth watch is the darkest and coldest time of night, which matches Matthew chapter 14. I'm not sure if your outline has 13. If it does, erase it. I'm sorry. 
uh, I had to make an edit there. Matthew 14, verses 25 to 32. Now, we're not going to go over there, uh, but uh, I want you to notice something. Look at verse number 50. For they all saw him and were troubled. Can I say this? When the Lord calls you home in the rapture, you're not going to be troubled at all. It's your blessed hope. But when the world is going through tribulation, all of a sudden you get a burst of what looks like a nuclear bomb going off in the sky, and a big uh, 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 a white horse starts flying down, and there's one that's set on it, uh, from, uh, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. That might be a little troubling, amen? And the Lord says, don't be troubled, it's me. Think about that. He's letting those people know in the darkest time of the night, picture the tribulation, hey, I'm coming to rescue you. I'm coming to help you. Uh, the, the, the Christian doesn't need that. When the Lord calls you home, you know exactly what's going on. That's where the, thing, that's where that, that the rapture and the second advent at the end of the tribulation are completely different. Now, guys, if I taught this without giving you the doctrinal background for everything we just talked about, I would be teaching you really nothing. Because you can make something look like something in the Bible, and it's not that. But if you have the doctrinal foundation that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks and months, this all lines up. Does that make sense? Uh, let, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Go back there if you would. First, and there's all, by the way, there's all kinds of stuff like that in your Bible if you're looking for it. If you're looking for it, there's all kinds of things where the Lord uh, does something. I mean, there's uh, one time where, uh, oh, let's see here. I think it mentions the, the second day. There's a wedding on the second day for Him coming somewhere. Jesus Christ coming, I think it's John chapter 2. You say, what's it a picture of? Well, it's a picture of uh, 2,000 years after Jesus Christ shows up, waiting two days, 2,000 years later. Now, people say, well, we're already past the year 2,000. I understand that. I get that. And I'm not going to start predicting the rapture. Calm down. Everyone's going to get all worried about that. I'm not going to do that, but I'll just say this. I'll, I'll just say that I don't think God's confused in His Bible. I think there's all kinds of reasons why our calendar and our way of dating things is probably messed up. Uh, I think He'll be right on time, even if we don't think He is. Amen. He'll be right on time, just like he said he would. Uh, here's another one. Uh, four days in a creation, what shows up? The sun. Well, who's born 4,000 years after creation? There's all kinds of stuff like that in your Bible if you're looking for it. But you've got to pay attention. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, look at verse number 5. You are all children, the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. All right, notice that uh, verse 5 is reinforced in verse number 8. But let us who are of the day. It's reinforced in verse number 8 when it mentions we are of the day. All right, to see another example of how this time of darkness that will be overtaking the world is not for the church, see Revelation. Go there. Keep your hand here in 1 Thessalonians. We'll go to Revelation chapter number 16. I'm trying to reinforce for you that this period of darkness... All right, that uh, is going to overtake the world in that fourth watch of the night, if you will. Um, I'm trying to reinforce for you that, that uh, basically what you have, if, if I were to take it and I were to look at this thing historically, uh, I would take the evening, uh, I would take midnight, uh, I would take the cock crowing, and I'd take morning. And those are the four watches of the night. And what you do is I would say, okay, here's the first 500 years, here's the next 500 years. Uh, 1500, uh, 10, uh, 1,000 to 1500 AD, 1500 to 2000. You say, well, we're at past 2000. Like I said earlier, I don't think we know what year it is. We're going to go with 2017. We're not going to start a cult and go, we know it's really 2000. All right, guys, I, I get it. I get it. We're in 2017, but my point is prophetically speaking. All right? Uh, so what you're looking at is the last watch of the night being the darkest one. Look at Revelation 16 and look at verse number 10. Revelation 16, verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Aren't you glad you're not going to be here for that? Every time some preacher tries to say we're going through it, I, I always go, look, man, enjoy it. I'm not going to be here, you know. Uh, there's people that try to teach you we're going to go through the tribulation, all that kind of stuff. I am thankful that we are not appointed unto that. Uh, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And, and again, I, I can't stress it enough. What you have in chapter 4 is the rapture. What you have in chapter 5 is a reference to tribulation and the day of the Lord where He comes back. And there's a contrast. And there's a contrast between chapter 4 and chapter 5. There's a, a contrast between day and night. There's a contrast between light and darkness. There's a contrast between children of the day and children of the night. 
All right. Um, look again at First Thessalonians chapter five, verse six. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night; they that be drunken are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Underline verse number nine. The wrath that he talks about in the day of the Lord is something you are not appointed unto. Therefore, again, I'm going to stress it, I'm going to hammer it, you are not going to go through the tribulation. That is the whole point of what's being try, trying to be relayed here, right? Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verses 6 through 9 matches, this is number 16 in your outline, matches Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 to 51. We're not going to read all of it right now. We're going to look at that. Uh, you know what? I say that. No, we probably need to look at it right now. Keep your hand here. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, there's going to be something that's referenced here. Now, earlier in Matthew 24, he talks about the, uh, the tribulation and enduring unto the end and all that kind of stuff. We've been through before. We're not going to read all of that. If you want to get that, you catch verses 3 through verse number 14 or 15. Uh, but go toward the end of the chapter and look at Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 42. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now, let me say it like this. That is probably where the, the similitude between the second advent and the rapture of the church ends. Because everything after this you're going you're to read, you're going to see, is not, not, it doesn't jive with the rapture of the church. Look at verse 43. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch, there it is. You say, what watch is it? See, the Jews understood there's four watches in the night. In what watch the thief would come. He doesn't take you as a thief. You're the bride. You're coming back with him. You're an accomplice to the crime. We talked about that. The thief would come. He would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made rule over his household to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Now, now, notice something. We're going, to, we're going to get into something in verse number 47. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler of all his good. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. Now, let me just stop right now. Let me ask you a question. If you, before the rapture of the church, aren't living right, do you lose your salvation? You don't. Now, read verse number 40, 49 and uh, verse 50 and 51. Now, if you're a Bible believer, you know what that means? You take the words of God literally. I was just talking with Brother John about that this week. If you take the words of God literally, all right, then what you don't do is you don't try to play games with them when something is said something, somewhere in the Bible, and you try to realign it with your doctrine and say, well, what it really means is this. Or in the Greek, it could have been said this way. What you do is you leave it as it is, and you go, okay, I don't necessarily completely understand this, but I'm going to take it as it is, and I'm going to, I'm going to agree that there's someone that's called a servant who's not living right when the Lord comes back, and look what it says about him in verse 51. Now, you can try all you want to contort this and try to make it fit for the church, but it doesn't. Because if you're not living right, you still don't go to hell. <laughs> If you're saved. And then don't get into this stuff, well, what he's talking about is people that aren't really saved. Well, that's not what it says either. It says somebody's a servant. Well, how, do you, how are you a servant of God if you're not saved? How are you a servant of God if you didn't have the truth? Somewhere along the way, and this is why you've got to rightly divide the word of God, because if you don't, you'll end up teaching stuff that isn't so. All right? What ends up happening is someone is told to watch for the Lord. I'm going to run it by you one more time. If you're not watching for the Lord when He comes back, do you still go in the rapture? Well, this guy doesn't. So this is different than the rapture. All right? And, and, and furthermore, it's the day of the Lord. It's the thief in the night thing again. Back there in verse number 43. So it's not for you. It's not the rapture. It's the second advent. Again, at the end of the tribulation, which you are not here for. Look at verse number uh, 49. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants. And look at this. And to eat... And drink with the drunken. You say, what does that match? It matches what you just read in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 7. They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. See, as the world gets more and more wicked, people are going to become more and more callous to the wickedness that's around them. And they're going to continue to spiral out of control. And what he's saying is, while you may have eternal security, don't go down that road. Don't follow suit with the rest of the world. All right? Now, you get raptured out of here regardless. 
This guy in Matthew chapter 24, because he's not looking for his master, he gets, le- he gets, he gets something else. When he comes, he gets cut asunder, and he gets appointed. We say, what is that? That's the second advent. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right, so what you have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 through 9, is you've got, you've got some, some recommendations, some, some commandments, if you will, I'll, I'll put it that way, some suggestions, if you want to put it mildly, for how you ought to live the Christian life in light of the fact that you are not a children, a, a child of darkness. All right, now what this does is this shows you what's coming. It's a foreshadow of what happens after we're gone. And so that's why it lines up with Matthew 24, verses 42 to 51. The idea is this. The idea, of, uh, number 16, is that since that is not our end, live in light of where we end up. Live in light of where you end up. All right? That means you ought to be living a life that's different, that's separate from the world. All right? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll jump into verse number 8 here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Are you getting anything this morning? Amen. All right. Uh, verse number uh, 8, but let us who are of the day be sober. There's that, that commandment again. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now notice something. Notice the armor there, all right? Number 17, uh, this verse shows us that the armor is different from that which what we find in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. The armor that you find here is a little bit different than what you find in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. Now, without reading all of what you, we're going to, uh, I'm not going to have you go read Ephesians chapter 6 right now. All right, but let me just say this. The armor found here has to do with our coming salvation. Now, this may sound heretical, but trust me, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking biblically when I say this. You are two-thirds saved. Amen. All right, your soul and your spirit are saved. Your body's not saved yet. Now, here's, here's, here's what you need to understand about that. It's not conditional. It's not conditional how you live. It's already done. You are predestined. That's where predestination comes in. You are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. The moment you got saved, you became one of His elect. All right? And the moment you got saved and you trusted Him as Savior, all right, you got put in the body of Christ and He got put in you, and that day star is going to rise in you someday. All right? But it hasn't happened yet. That's why Romans chapter 8 talks about the adoption of our bodies. All right? So the point is this, the armor as found in 1 Thessalonians has to do with our coming salvation, whereas the one in Ephesians chapter 6 has to do with our completed salvation. All right? Ephesians chapter 6 is, is talking about the armor of God that you're going to have because of what Christ has already done for you. It's completed, all right? whereas 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 has to do with something different. Let me show what I mean by that. Look at verse number 8. He talks about a breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, look at this, the hope of salvation. Not the helmet of salvation, the helmet, which is the hope of salvation. You say, what is that, what is that connected with? All right, go over to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Look at Romans chapter 8, and look, if you would, at verse number 23. Romans chapter 8, verse number 23. Do we have any of these that are left over? I think we have a couple, right? All right. Hey, Miguel, if you want to use this, follow along. And if anyone else, does anyone else not have an outline that would like one? Brother, you might help me out with that. Sure. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Raise your hand, and Brother Jeff will get that for you. All right. Um, Romans chapter 8, and look, if you would, at Romans chapter 8 in verse number 23. Romans chapter 8 in verse number 23. All right, Romans 8, look at verse 23. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, look at this, waiting for the adoption. Now, we've been through this before, I'll say, but I'll hit it again. Aren't you already adopted into the, into the family of God? He's translated you into the kingdom of His dear Son. You've already been adopted. The eternal part of you has been adopted, but there's a part of you that has not yet received its adoption. You say, why? Because God could not adopt this thing as it is. Amen? He's got to change it. And so it says here, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. I am not waiting for the redemption of my soul. That has already happened. (laughs) 
When he shed his blood and I said, Lord, I'll take you, he said, I'll take you too. And he, he redeemed my soul. It's been washed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But my body's not experienced that yet. So when he talks about the helmet, the hope of salvation, he's talking about a future event that is yet to come for the child of God. That is the rapture. All right? Uh, look, look here in verse 24. For we are saved by what? Hope. But the salvation that he's talking about is not the salvation of your soul, but rather the salvation of your body. And you can see that by the context of what he's talking about in Romans chapter 8, verse 23 through 25. All right, so when he says we're saved by hope, I had a, I had a person one time, I asked him if they're saved, they said, I hope so. And I said, well, you know, you can know. No, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. You're getting back forward, you know. And, and he said, well, what do, what do you think it means in Romans chapter 8 where it says we're saved by hope? I said, well, brother, that's, that's, that's your body. It's not your soul. The Lord does it. Listen, it, it's really simple. He that hath the Son of God hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Not that you may hope, or you might guess, or whatever. You may know. But there's something that you're hoping for. That means there's an expectation not yet realized. You're looking forward to it. All right? Um, I, am, I, am, I am hoping to see my... I, I'm, I'm hoping for the day when Jesus Christ comes back and redeems his body. I'm not hoping for it thinking, I hope it happens. I'm hoping for it in the sense that I hope it happens now. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. There's an expectation that's there that has not yet been realized. So in your outline, let me say this. The hope of salvation is connected with, with what we read in Romans 8, 23-25 in regards to the adoption of our bodies, which is the hope of salvation that's being referred to. It is not a reference to the salvation. It's number 18 in your outline. It is not a reference to the salvation of your souls, as a believer today. All right, look at 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, we've got to move, we've got to move. 1 Peter chapter number 1, and uh, look, if you would, at verse number 3. When you talk about the salvation of your soul, that's a different kind of hope. It's a lively hope, all right? You're not, you're not hoping that you're saved in the sense that I hope I'm going to heaven when I die. That's done. All right, what this hope that he's talking about, being saved by hope, he's talking about the expectation, looking forward to the redemption of your body. All right, uh, look at uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the, Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that faith not away, reserved in heaven for you. Look at this. Who are kept by your good works. <laughs> who are kept by your good, godly Christian lifestyle. I, I, listen, I, 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 I believe in holiness. I believe in holy living. There are times even this week when I find myself going, Lord, I'm way too complacent with the things in this world. I don't want to be complacent. I want to be closer to you. I want to be more holy. I believe in that. But I don't believe that because I'm doing these things, therefore I am saved. You got to twist. Yeah, that's a really twisted way of thinking because then you walk around going, well, they're not doing that. Therefore, they must not be saved like I am. <laughs> and what's interesting is every time someone gives me an example of why this person is not saved, I ask them, you never done that? Or what's your problem? What is the thing you're hung up on? You know, and the reality is we're all hung up on something. I'm not advocating, I'm not, listen, I'm not making light of sin. I'm not saying it's okay. You ought to deal with it. You ought to deal with it now. You should not be complacent with sin in your life. I, I, don't, I don't believe you should be, but what I am saying is this. We are saved not because of what we do, but because you are saved, you ought to do good works. Amen. And so what he's saying here is this. You're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You say, what is that? That is the salvation of your body. But look, you're kept by the power of God, so you can't lose it if you wanted to. So that's, that's what you need to get there, all right? Uh, the hope, number 18, the hope for a believer today is found in the blessed hope of Titus chapter 2, which is different than that which the tribulation saints will hope for. All right, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You understand that? You understand the tribulation saints are waiting for him to come back? to be rescued and their, their, uh, their souls and bodies to be brought into the kingdom. You know what you're going to be looking for? You're looking for one-third of you to get right with God. That's it. 
All right, that's different than the tribulation saint. That's the body that needs to be made right. All right, First, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 is further proof we will not be here for the tribulation. As a matter of fact, notice that he says we're not appointed to wrath. Keep your hand here. Look at Luke chapter 21, verse number 23. Luke 21, verse 23. And in your outline, the wrath that is to come takes place during the tribulation, as seen in Revelation chapter 15, verse 7 through 8. All right? This is a time of wrath upon his nation, the nation of Israel. Let me show you what I mean by that. Luke chapter 21, we are not appointed unto wrath. You say, why? We're the church. All right? Not the nation of Israel. Uh, look at Luke 21. Look at verse number 23. You say, what's the context? Well, look back at verse number 20. Look back at verse number 21. The context is the same conversation they're having in Matthew 24, which is the end of the world and the signs of His coming, not the rapture of the church. So look at verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land. You say, what is the land he's talking about? Look at verses 20 and 21. The land of Israel. And look at the last part of verse 23. And wrath upon this people. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. The point is this, the point here is in your outline, uh, the wrath that is to come takes place during the tribulation as seen in Revelation 15, 7 through 8. And we just read about Luke 21, 23. Now, we're not going to go to Revelation 15, but I encourage you to read that another time. But it talks about God's wrath being poured out on the world during the time of tribulation. The end of this, this is your outline, verse, uh, number 19, the end of this is what John the Baptist preaches about. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. You see, what does he preach about? Well, go back there. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, look at verses 11 and 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. Two separate things. They're not the same. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, second advent, not rapture. We get brought in on part of that. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There's that fire from verse number 11. And you say, what is he preaching about? He's preaching about the end. He's preaching about the end. You say, why? Because his whole message has to do with the kingdom. All right, now think about this in light of what we're looking at in your outline, number 20. The salvation spoken of in verse 9 is a, ref is a reference to the salvation of your bodies. This is evident from verse 10. Number 21, the second advent is just a prelude of the wrath that comes for eternity. You say, what happens? Well, he destroys them with the brightness of his coming and the spirit of his mouth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or chapter 1 rather. All right, and then after that, you say, what happens? Well, you get a thousand years of him reigning on the earth. And those folks that were destroyed at His coming are in hell, and they're led out to hear God's final judgment. And they go out into the lake of fire. That ought to bother you a little bit about your co-workers, people that you know, neighbors, family members. You say, why? Because that's what's headed for them. If you don't stand up and open your mouth about Jesus Christ. Go back, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 10. We're not going to get into all of this because this, this branches out into another subject. But uh, what I'm going to ask you to do this morning is I'm going to ask you to keep your outline here and bring it with you uh, next Sunday. And we'll have some more fill in the blanks for you. But we'll want to keep this page intact. And uh, we'll get into some stuff about soul sleep. So you understand that when he talks about sleeping, it's not the soul but rather the body. Uh, look, if you would, at uh, uh, number 22. It says there are two groups spoken of in verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, there, uh, it says, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Those that wake and those that sleep, that matches. Go back to chapter 4 and look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus. 
You know what I pray for in the nursery? I pray that those babies sleep in Jesus during the service. Amen? <laughs> all right? Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. But uh, that, now that thing is, in, a, in its all seriousness, that sleep is talking about those that die in the Lord. Those who are sleeping their body, not their soul. Those who have died and their bodies have been laid to, what do we say? We have laid them to what? Rest. Rest. Why, do you, why, is it, why do you think we say that? Where does that come from? Remember there in, in John where Jesus is talking about Lazarus? And he's saying that he's sleeping, and the disciples are like, well, he's, that's good, he's resting. And finally he goes, no, he's dead. All right, so that shows you the Bible uses that word sleep to refer to the death of the body. So those that sleep in Jesus, all right, there in verse 14, but look at verse 15. For this we say, chapter 4, verse 15, this we say unto you that by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, that is those that wake from chapter 5, verse 10, we which are alive and and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or pre-event or go before them which are asleep. So again, what you have in verse number 10, uh, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. There's another reminder about the eternal security of your soul and the assurance that you will be taken in the rapture. Again, drawing a parallel between what you're reading about there and what you read about earlier in the chapter about the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. See, whether you wake or sleep, you're going to be taken up. That's what he's saying to those that are believers, those that have placed their faith in Christ during this time. All right? So uh, in verse number 11, I'll end with this thought. You know, oftentimes people go through trouble, and if you're saved for any amount of time, you're going to go through some trouble. Uh, let me say this, if you're lost, you're going to go through trouble. If you're without the Lord, you're going to go through trouble. If you're saved and you go to church and you do everything you can to live right, you're still going to go through trouble. <laughs> All right, Trouble is a part of life. Job says a man is born in trouble as the sparks fly upward. But when someone is going through, when you go through trouble, you go through trouble so you can help somebody else who eventually is going to go through that as well. All right? When, when, when someone comes to me and says, I'm going through this particular thing, there are times where I can relate to it. And there are times where I go, I don't understand. I've never been through that before. And there may be times where I go seek out another person in this church who has been through that and try to see if they can help them out. You say, why, Pastor? You're the pastor. You got Listen, I can pray with them. I can show them biblical things. But I have never been through what they've been through. And sometimes we're tempted to go, when someone's going through trouble, to go, I understand what you're going through. And you really don't. And I'll tell you, there's a practical lesson here right at the end of what we're looking at in verse 11. The greatest comfort you can provide to a child of God, regardless of what they're going through, is, Brother, I don't understand. I've never been through it. I can't tell you why you're going through this right now, but I'm praying for you. And can't, I'll tell you what, I can't wait till the Lord comes back and takes us home. I can't wait till all these troubles are gone. Can you? And you can weep with them and you can pray with them. You say, what do you do? You comfort yourselves together. Same thing as what you find at the end of chapter 4, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We'll stop there. Any questions about what we looked at this morning? Any questions? No? All right, let's go.